that's where I usually stop on a pretty much daily basis to get gas or get something to eat. And what I call my Superman juice, uh, Red Bull. That helps me out on a daily basis also. I know it's not good for you, but it helps. Getting up so early does, doesn't give me the time to uh, stay home and actually get a nice home cooked meal. So thanks to Wawa, I get it on the go. Stop here for about five, 10 minutes, get something to eat in me, and then just take off and get on the road again. We have the latest statistics from the U.S. Census Bureau to give us a very specific measurement of how poor the city of Reading is compared to the rest of the country. And we have the unfortunate distinction of being named the poorest city in the country of any city of 65,000 uh, population or greater. The biggest thing has been the loss of jobs. I think the number one most devastating one was when AT&T, when Lucent Industries um, closed their office here in Reading. There were over 700 people who were laid off and lost their jobs. I think today for the residents in the city of Reading, it's a daily struggle to, to get by, to pay for basic needs, to get access to health care that you need to put food on your table, and to, to care for your children. I don't know what the answer is, but I mean, I think the dilemma is, is how in the world are we gonna get jobs back for people? And it has to happen soon because people don't have hope. And if you grow up without hope, then you just are gonna give up. And then another generation will come along and then it gets harder and harder and it becomes more entrenched. My name is Glenn Kegerize and uh, I'm 46 years old. And I live in Reading, Pennsylvania. I live here with my daughter, Kelsey. She is 16. Uh, I lived here basically my whole life. I, I went away in the Marines for four years, and I came right back. I went to Remcon Plastics, and I started out as a, a machine operator and worked my way up there and was a supervisor for 13 or 14 years. The uh, pay wasn't great, but it was consistent, and my wife was working at the same time, so between the two of us, we made it. We made a decent living. Then, before you know it, he lost his job, and my sister had worked at Lucent's, and she lost her job, so they all lost their jobs. And, you know, for a while, they were all maintaining with unemployment and stuff like that, but, I mean, they were probably even on that almost two years. Little by little, you know, the expenses don't change, your income changes, but your the bills don't change. Yeah, I got stuff upstairs to pack. I mean, if you just want to, if you want to go up. When my wife and I split, I moved in with my brother. But now my brother is ill, and he's in Florida because he's living with his uh, son. Regular bills are paid, but the mortgage never got touched because there just there wasn't that kind of money to do it. So I'm basically freeloading in the house until it's taken away. The house is already uh, in the process of foreclosure. I yell at my kids if they don't come down with a box. <laughs> Everything's being piled into one room so that we can get it close to the front door and easily access to get out in case I don't have a lot of help when I have to go. So I keep bringing it in. So getting it all together, getting it, getting it out of here so as we can move whatever we got to uh, wherever we're going. Don't know that yet. Without my family, I, I'd be out in the street now. I, I know that. Everybody worked all of their lives, and it was difficult to see things falling apart as they did. You try to help each other out, but you don't always have the means to do it. 
when we look at the issues facing the city of Reading, we're able to look at some of the root causes that result in, in high poverty, and one of the biggest ones is education. Reading School District only has about a 68% graduation rate. So that's a high number, 32% of the kids who start kindergarten in Reading School District will not graduate um, from the district at the end. We have a lot of kids who are now following in the adults' footsteps and not having um, even a high school degree. So that's clearly a challenge and something that needs to be addressed long term. I grew up here in Reading. I went to Reading High for maybe like two years. I didn't graduate from Reading High. I got my GED from Arbor Career Center. I thought I was going to be in college. I was always those type of kids that wanted to go to college, but I wasn't too. I always wanted to be running around too. I had my son, I had Manny at 15, so there crushed my whole dream. <laughs> Go, read your book. Spanish rice with chicken. Ch um, chicken in the oven. Those were the leftovers from last night. So I got math and I think two spellings because I didn't check. Well, you have I to check. Growing up here, I was always out in the streets pretty much, running around, being a kid. <laughs> but it was, um, saw a lot of things happen here. A lot of bad things happen. In some ways, it affected a lot of people where they did the same things. And to me, I didn't want to do the same things. I didn't want to continue, or my kids to see that, or me do that. I've had friends with parents on drugs. I've had friends with parents that are in jail for life. Or my friends ended up in foster care that I haven't seen in years. Today, I start at Walmart. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be making $8.20 an hour as a cashier. And it's only seasonal for right now, which the manager said, um, if I did a good job, they usually keep you. It pretty much all depends. I was customer service at Lowe's for four years. Manny, I thought you said you weren't gonna do it, and it's 7.53, so you got two minutes. Actually, the day I left Lowe's, I had to leave because my son was having an asthma attack in school, so I pretty much got fired. They're always being sick. My son takes like four meds a day. My other son was just diagnosed with ADHD, so he was always being kicked out of daycare. <laughs> so hopefully they're good now. I can keep a job now, hopefully. Manuel's seven and Nasir's four. When I worked at Lowe's, I, ha I had health insurance for a little bit, but then I told them to uh, discontinue it because it was $100 out of my paycheck a month. The hundred dollars I could have used for something else. I was paid ten sixty five at Lowe's, and then now at Walmart I'm making eight twenty. It's a big difference, but I have to adjust to it because it took me two months to find a job, so I can't just not take it because of the pay. It's better than nothing right now. It is three fifty seven a.m. on Friday morning. I started working in the Atlantic States about maybe uh, a month and a half ago. Pretty much it's an hour and 15 minutes. It's about 74 miles each way to get to where I work at, from Reading to uh, Phillipsburg, New Jersey. So I mean, pretty much almost three hours a day out of my, out of my day driving. Any type of place in Reading that would offer me what I, what I have right now, full benefits um, and the rate I'm making, I've looked around, but I haven't seen anything. So unfortunately, this is what, I, this is what it comes down to making the sacrifice and coming out here. I was in Iraq for about a year and a half almost. Almost a year and a half. It's something that completely changes your whole life, changes your perspective onto your everyday life, how you live it. Makes you feel like you can't, there's nothing you can't do. Coming back, trying to adjust was honestly a horrifying situation. My first experience when I came back was uh, Went to this company, I was at an interview, everything was going great. His first question to me was, what have I done? And um, I proudly stated, you know, I just came back from Iraq, from serving my country uh, for about a year and a half. And he just completely looked at me and stated, um, is that all you've done? 
the fact that I've been out there doing what I did wasn't enough for anybody here. It made me feel, uh, feel pretty worthless. What gives me hope about Reading is the number of really good-hearted families that are really trying hard despite amazing difficulties to raise kids that care about each other, that are respectful. Um, the people that come here saying, you know, we don't just want to get a handout. We, we want to rebuild our lives. We want to be whole people. We want to be, um, in fact, even they want more for their kids. They really want their kids to grow up to be able to make a contribution and to have worthwhile lives. And they don't want to see them caught in a cycle of poverty. I just got a job after two years of being uh, on unemployment and then without unemployment at Mack Truck. Unfortunately, it was second shift, and second shift is uh, th 3 to 11. Uh, usually, I leave at 1.30, um, because first of all, if you're late, you're fired, so that's, <laughs> you just can't be late. It takes me an hour to get there, an hour to get back. I gotta do what I gotta do now. It's, it's past the time I can be picky and choosy. I gotta get some money so my daughter has food. When he was unemployed, he was here all the time. He was never without something to do. He unloaded the food for the food pantry. He worked at the food pantry. And I know that you know Glenn and, and Kelsey are heavily supplementing their food with the food that they're able to get here. I think, uh, I think that my faith has carried me. I, I just couldn't not have dealt with all the stuff through my separation and through my uh, losing the job and through my just uh, depression and, and, and seeing uh, my family have lots of issues. Um, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, I don't think I could have got through it without God and without, without their, the guidance of uh, not just the pastor, you know, the, the family at Hope. Glenn is really um, an, an amazing person. First of all, he wears his faith on his sleeve, which it, it's just really beautiful to see. He's been a real leader here. He also was our like youth guru here. Um, and now that he's working second shift, he can't do any of the things that used to really give his life meaning and really allowed him to contribute. It was kind of better because he was always home and we always were together. Um, it was, it was harder because we didn't have money. Um, so that's kind of the trade-off that we had to make, I guess, from then to now. That's why, you know, I'm here trying to make sure Kelsey's taken care of because, you know, this, this is killing him to have to work second shift. He would, you know, they have a really good bond, you know, a close bond. So, but right now she understands, he understands it's what they have to do just to get a job. You know, he has to have a job to provide for. So like she said, it's kind of a trade-off. So it's... Not always an easy pill to swallow. I get to see her uh, for a few minutes on Friday night, and basically that's my that's my existence with my daughter because uh, she goes to visit her mom. Uh, usually Sunday uh, after church, she goes over there, and Saturday she has competitions for bands. I've said numerous times lately. At my age, I never imagined life to be as difficult as it, as it is now. We're always raised to do the right thing. You know, be responsible for yourself, even get health insurance. And I know none of my siblings, all three of them had no health insurance whatsoever. When you're on your own and try to pay for health insurance and you're only making unemployment, it's just almost impossible to pay your bills and have that. Since I left Remcon, I just don't get sick. <laughs> or if I do, I, you know, I go to the over-the-counter stuff, just grab some Tylenol, uh, you know, do what you can do. Even if folks are working, a lot of times there are no benefits. They're putting together two or three part-time jobs just to make ends meet. And so they are doing without any kind of health care. So there are lots of health problems. There are no free clinics in the city at all. 
Uh, there is one out in the surrounding um, county, uh, but it, people from Reading don't have any way to get there. Right now I'm basically living day to day. There's a lot of stresses. The county right now is funding my daycare. If I didn't have that, it would be about $50 a week. It all depends on your family size. And right now I pay $5 a week. That's important because if it gets taken away from us, it's an eight month waiting list. So if we get a job and we need our child in daycare as soon as possible, and that's not there, we can lose our job because we don't have any childcare. The only bill right now is my rent. <laughs> I haven't been able to pay it. When I got my 401k, I gave them money. But I mean, right now, I don't know how my paychecks are gonna look this job around. I'm wondering how I'm gonna pay it. I'm actually um, <coughs> trying to work something out with my landlord to not get evicted. At least not now. <laughs> At least wait till after the holidays. And, I mean, it's not good to think like that because I don't want to get evicted, but I mean, I have to. It's hard. I try my best, and especially because of the support of my family and my friends, I've been able to keep it. If I get evicted from here, um, my sister-in-law already told me I can go live with her, but where she lives, I don't want to live. And that's not a good area. There's always shootouts that happen, fights that happen. It's just a mess. There's a lot of drug activity down there. It gets emotional sometimes, because I wish I, would, I didn't live here. I wish I had a better job. I wish I could give my kids a better living. Mm. I don't know, without money, you can't leave. But then, if you don't have a job here, you can't get the money to leave. All of my friends, most of them have their dads, the kid's father with them still. Some of them are like me, their dad, the fathers are in jail. I want to go back to school and I want to, the highest thing I want to do is be an RN, but I know that's hard. So I want to stay, take baby steps, like do medical assistant and then once I get that, I mean, I just want to be able to get by. I really worry about the, the kids the most because they, there's kind of a lack of hope, I think. Uh, with a lot of them here in Reading. There are a lot of programs that are trying to address that and are doing some job training, but the jobs just aren't there. On top of that, um, we have a lot of folks who may be employed, but are employed in jobs that are temporary, that aren't paying very good wages, and that aren't paying very good benefits. Uh, and so we have the situation where the kinds of jobs that the residents of the city are prepared for, unfortunately, are low-paying jobs. Here in Reading, there wasn't much going on. As far as jobs, um, my wife and I, we just pretty much worked on a $9 hour job, $10 an hour job, sometimes having two, three jobs. At my lowest point, how much were we making on an annual basis, both of us together, I would have to say maybe 30000 Was that enough to get by? No, not, not with the child, I mean, not with the child at all. I mean, think about Pampers, formula, baby food, clothing. Our son was born, we didn't have no jobs, no medical, no nothing. I mean, it was, uh, then we got the medical bill from the, <laughs> from the hospital, it was about almost eight, nine thousand dollars And uh, we had to pay out of pocket. We lost our house, we lost both of our vehicles. Having a mortgage of $1,500 in two car payments, $10 an hour, is not gonna cut it. We're not gonna make ends meet with that type of, of um, money as far as working for a temp agency. So by the ending of 2008, the house was already in foreclosure. I came to a point where we had to f rely on food stamps. I mean, yeah, pretty much. It, it just came down to that. Without food stamps, we probably wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have made it. Um, how was it getting services from the state? And um, I'll never forget that. It was the first time ever. I walked into the office and I saw everybody there. And um, it, it felt really awkward because I know I didn't belong there. I mean, I'm a fighter. And uh, we've, we've been struggling and fighting tooth and nail since we've been together. And uh, just sitting there looking at everybody else around me. Um, and it was, it was uh, overwhelming. I started crying. I started crying because I've never been in that situation. It's all right, calm down. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's, uh, 
coming from <clears throat> from where we're at, I would say a pretty decent life. We talk about, okay, well, my guy, you know, we're down to our last two, three hundred dollars, and it's overwhelming at times. The whole time everything was happening, I was hoping I would get a light shining on me, at least get a break in life. Sometimes you feel like giving up on everything because things just keep piling up and piling up. I mean, all I was just hoping is just for someone to give me a chance to actually show them what I'm about and prove to them that, you know, um, you know, that I can do something. I actually started online college while I was in Iraq. It took me five years to get a bachelor's degree online. One of the good things uh, the military actually did for me was uh, pay for my college. It was 100% tuition. And then that's where in Atlantic States, where actually we're heading now, gave me the opportunity they gave me. Um, full full time job, benefits from day one, and a management role, which has been honestly a life changing opportunity for, for my family and I. They gave me the opportunity because of my degree. From everything that I've been through, I thank God because of my kids. Every day they push me, every day they make, my, they make me feel like a better man. They make me want to be a better man every single day and do anything I have to do to make sure that they have the clothes on their backs and they have the food they need. That's what makes me feel that I'm a success every single day. Lovely day. As long as I keep a job, keep this job at this rate that um, we should be able to pull ourselves out of this and find an apartment and, and be okay. Um, hopefully Mac is a place that's gonna be open for a long, long time and, and be able to keep all the people that they keep there because I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I don't have any hope. <laughs> I'm basically looking at everything day by day. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. If something's gonna go wrong. If I'm not gonna be able to make it to work, what's gonna happen? Or anything. If I had my dream come true, I'd have a car, a working one. You know, I'd live in a good neighborhood with my kids. I'd have a job. And even if I didn't have a spouse and it was just me and my kids, I'd be perfectly fine with that. As long as I had a good paying job and all of that. The basically the dream anybody would want. Have I seen the city change? Yes. About four or five years ago, people would actually walk out, I mean, help each other, say hi to everybody, and nowadays it's just people looking down at you or looking straight at you because they think you're gonna do something. I mean, it's just, nowadays in, in Reading, you can't, you can't turn a page in the newspaper without seeing somebody got killed, somebody got robbed, somebody got raped. It's gotten so bad that people are just breaking into houses looking trying to steal food. Um, how long do I, will we plan on staying in Reading now? Um, honestly, I wouldn't say too much longer, honestly. Um, you, you can't make it here. I mean, everybody that comes here, unfortunately, just stays here. I mean, me leaving the Marine Corps was my first step out of here. And unfortunately, I ended up right back here. And it's, it's been tough to be able to move, move forward, but um, You have to leave to be able to make it, honestly.